Well, I have to say it is with great humility that today's guest uh, is going to be sharing information on the show. I, I can't even begin to tell you how thrilled I am to have my guest, Zoe Weil, on the show. She has an incredible background. She's doing amazing stuff in the world. And it's all about educating the next education to be uh, next uh, generation to be more compassionate. And Zoe, it is great to have you here. Welcome to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show, where your host, Kathleen Gage, shines the spotlight on vegan and plant-based businesses and entrepreneurs newers, from all walks of life committed to cruelty-free eating, healthy lifestyles, animal compassion, and the environment. Enjoy the show. Thank you, Kathleen. It's great to be here. You know, I, I would love for you to give... Uh, uh, a 30,000 foot view of your background. I know that's going to be difficult because you're so accomplished and you're doing so much, but let us know a little bit about how you got involved in what you're doing today, uh, where the turning point for you was. Well, <laughs> um, I will try to make this succinct. I cared passionately about suffering and injustice. And I didn't really know that there was much that I could do about it. But I wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. And when I was in graduate school, I was looking for a summer job. And I found a program that offered week long courses to middle school students, it was offered at the University of Pennsylvania. And I pitched a whole bunch of courses, I pitched one on critical television watching, no one signed up for that. I pitched one on environmental sustainability, and that ran. I pitched one on animal issues, and that was the second most popular of the 60 courses that were offered in the program that summer. This was in 1987. Hmm. You know, kids love animals, and they weren't going to be taking a course where they just got to learn about happy things about animals. I actually taught them about what was happening to animals and what they could do to make a difference. And one boy went home after learning about product testing on animals where soaps and oven cleaner and personal care products, makeup are squeezed into the eyes of conscious rabbits, force fed to them in quantities that kill, smeared on their abraded skin. And he went home and he made his own homemade leaflets. Now, as I said, this was in 1987. Mm -hmm. So he hand wrote his leaflets and he came back into class the next day and he wanted to hand them out, not to his fellow classmates, but he wanted to hand them out on a street corner in Philadelphia. He'd become an activist overnight. He wanted to create change. I hadn't told him that was something that he should do or that anybody should do, but he saw a path to educating others. And I saw a path. That summer was when I found my life's work as a humane educator, somebody who teaches about the interconnected issues of human rights and animal protection and environmental sustainability so that we can create a world that does the most good and least harm for everybody. Right. So that was my journey. And then I ended up creating a humane education program that I called Animal Learn. And I went into schools in the greater Philadelphia area. We were reaching about 10,000 students a year. And then in 1996, I co-founded the Institute for Humane Education, primarily to train other people to be humane educators, because I was seeing the power of this. I was seeing what happens when young people learn about issues and they want to make a difference and they learn how. And I thought, we need to integrate this into the curriculum at schools. This can't just be something that individual humane educators offer as a one-off in schools, it has to be integrated. So we created the first graduate programs in humane education. They're now offered through an affiliation with Antioch University. We have a master of education program, a master of arts program, a graduate certificate program, and we also have a doctorate in education specializing in humane education. And again, intersecting the issues of human rights and animal protection and environmental sustainability. And so now there's a path for others to do this. We have professional learning. We're working with schools, not only across the US, but on six continents. And so we're 
we're educating young people to be what we call solutionaries who can solve the problems we face. I, I love that the 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 title solutionaries because um, you sound so hopeful. I I love your enthusiasm and I I like to think that things are changing. And I would imagine from 1987 when um, this was all first starting with you educating people about what's going on with animals, the inhumane treatment, um, has it gotten better or has it gotten worse? Because I, I know for myself, I've been a vegan for five years now, and I had no clue on what was going on. I had no clue about factory farming to the extent I do now. I had no clue about uh, what's happening to our oceans, what's happening to our, our uh, the fowls out there with the, the just it, it's it's crazy what I've been learning. And I think has it changed? So from 1987 to now, has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Or is it a combination of the two? It's gotten better and worse. Okay. So, um, and and I've been vegan for 34 years. So Love um, it. welcome uh, to being vegan. For I'm a five. baby vegan. <laughs> Compared to people like you, I am a baby vegan, but I'm committed. Yeah. I'm definitely it's committed. So it's so funny when people ask me, you know, how you, you know, you can't be vegan. How can you get your protein? I'm like, I've been around now for 34 years as a vegan and I'm an athlete and I'm doing okay. Right, right. But to answer your question, it's here's how it's gotten better. Vastly more people have changed their behaviors. Mm -hmm. There are many more vegans and vegetarians. There are many more people who care about animal issues. There are laws being passed all the time to extend protections to animals. There is a tremendous amount that has changed. However, the population around the globe has doubled in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And the extreme poverty has declined and more people have entered the middle class. And so more people are eating animals. So many more animals are being killed than in 1987, despite the changes because of population growth and because people can afford to buy meat. So it's this is a both and, and this is why we need to educate people to be solutionaries because we need to change these systems. We are not going to solve problems like climate change and animal cruelty and social injustice by just people making personal choices, by just individuals making personal choices. Those choices matter quite a bit and they collectively add up to change. However, we need to change the systems. Not everybody's going to make different personal choices, but if we, for example, end animal agriculture the way we know it, and we are able to produce cultivated meat that does mm -hmm. not kill any animals and plant-based meats, and everybody can't tell the difference, and they're cheaper, uh, if we can get it to that point that they're cheaper and they are not filled with pesticides and antibiotics right. and all of those things, then people will get on board with that. People will follow the systems. We need to create new systems and we need solutionaries for that. Well, okay. So I, I want to play devil's advocate here because I, you know, I, I, in a perfect world, would love to see everybody switch to plant-based. And yet every time I go to the grocery store, I get a reality check. Yeah. I live in a very uh, small community in central Oregon. Um, we've got some acreage. We live across from a river. And so I live a very, um, if you will, a very uh, jaded life in a lot of ways. And then I go out into the community and I see how unhealthy people are getting. I see what's happening with animals and um, what and I see the poverty. I, I actually went to go on a run yesterday to a park I hadn't been to in a while. And I was shocked to see how much of a decline we had gone through. People were literally sleeping in the parking lot yeah. and, and people were living out of their vehicles and all that. And this is right outside Eugene, Oregon. And so I, I'm curious, what changes can we implement as individuals to push the narrative uh, on a larger scale, because there's a lot of politicians that could care less about the changes. Uh, they're lining their pockets. I mean, that is a reality. Uh, big pharma, healthcare, all of that. So for somebody like me, who I, I'm so committed to this, but I also get uh, deflated many times when I see what the reality is, what can we do? 
well, this is why we need to educate people to be solutionaries. Like, okay. This is exactly the reason. So you started off your question saying, let me play devil's advocate. Um, but I'm not sure I understood what you're playing devil's advocate about exactly. Well, okay. The the fact that we, as, as people who want to see the narrative change and we're doing what we can, I do it through my podcast show, through my writings, you do it through your yeah. uh, TED Talks, through your education system, to through all the programs that you've implemented and continue to implement. But in reality, are we really making a difference? So that's got, that's got the it. devil's advocate side. Got it, got it. Yes. Um, so first of all, the fact that you're writing and doing a podcast is exactly what solutionaries who have those skills do. So when I'm educating somebody to be a solutionary, and there's a whole process, we have a solutionary framework. It is a four-phase process. Okay. Anybody can go to our website. They can download our free solutionary guidebook and they can they can follow this process. And okay. if you're an educator, uh, I wrote a book called The World Becomes That We Teach About How Do We Actually Do This? And we have professional um, learning for educators to, to actually learn how to do this. Um, but one of the questions that I ask is actually three questions. What issues do you care about solving? What are you good at? And what do you love to do? And if you can find the place where the answers to those three questions meet, mm -hmm. you are on your way to making a positive contribution. Imagine if all of us learned that. Imagine if that is core to what's taught in schools. Everybody is answering that question. Everybody is learning how to be a solutionary. Everybody is learning the process, the research and investigation process, the critical thinking and systems mm -hmm. thinking and mm -hmm. strategic thinking. They're actually identifying problems and collaboratively solving them and talking to a variety of stakeholders. The problems we face, whether they're political or economic or they're food systems or transportation or energy systems or production and construction systems, we created all those systems. Right, right. There is no reason at all that we can't create more sustainable, humane, and just versions right. of those systems. We're really smart as a species in terms of creating things. We can do that. We just need to have the ethical component of doing the most good and the least harm to people, animals, and the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need the thinking skills and the research skills and the practice. It's not that hard. It's not easy. I don't want to make right, it sound right, but it's not that hard. And education, the education system is the root system that underlies all other societal systems. So the reason that at the Institute for Humane Education, the reason we're addressing this system is because we believe that if we can transform this system, then young people are going to learn to be solutionaries. And no matter what fields, professions, careers, work they go into, they can build solutionary systems within them. So they could go into law, they could go into politics, they could go into business, they could go into healthcare or education themselves, they could go into construction or production. Whatever they go into, if they bring this solutionary lens and this solutionary mindset, then we can change the systems. I love that. So love that. it is hard right. to imagine that we solve all of our problems overnight and it won't be overnight, but it's absolutely possible. I, I love your enthusiasm. I really do, because um, I, I know that if we left to our own devices, if we're in our own little silo and we, we feel defeated at times, and then when we get surrounded by people like yourself, then the the hope and the um, uh, the possibilities um, start to emerge. And I want to remind people that you're listening to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show. I'm talking with Zoe Weil, who is the co-founder and president of Institute for Humane Education. And um, Zoe, what what have you seen as the greatest? uh growth that has taken place since the mid 80s and um where do you see things going in the future that's a really big question okay what popped into my mind is that 
young people are really concerned yes. about what's happening on our planet. They're really concerned about climate change. Um, that is a kind of shift we need. We need that energy. Mm -hmm. We need that dedication. Um, AI is going to be a game changer. Now, it's possible it'll be a game changer for um, the worse. I don't think it will be. I think right. AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is going to be a game changer in really positive ways. There is no information that we can't get instantaneously at this point. Imagine every child having an AI tutor. They're going to be able to learn what they need to learn. What we need to then do is we need to learn how to ensure that information that we get is accurate. Correct. How to collaborate and not just argue about things. We're so polarized. Those are really important things that we need to learn and then there's so many ways that AI can you know, help us develop clean energy and help us develop uh, cures for diseases without experimenting on animals and help us solve some of the challenges that we face. So those are, I think, the combination of artificial intelligence and a passionate youth, AI also has the capacity to build the kind of society where everybody's needs are met. Right. So if we can, if we can head into a world where everybody's needs are met, there is no more poverty. There is no one goes to bed hungry. You know, I believe that we then free up the capacity of humans to work more effectively together. Right, right. Again, it's it, it's not a slam dunk because you know you're it's right in the other direction. And it is about educating people and and having them see what the truth is because in many ways we've been lied to for for decades. And that the lies come from the food manufacturers, from healthcare, from big pharma, from politicians. And so it's really pulling back the curtain. But before we do, Zoe, could you? let people know how they can find you. What's the best website to go to, to access information? Because you've got some phenomenal information on your website. Thank you. So it's just humaneeducation.org. And we have loads of free downloadable resources. There's information about our online course. There's information about our graduate programs, uh, tons and tons of resources, links to my TEDx talks. So and my books. So people Okay, can... wonderful. And and I do encourage people to access your website, check out your TED Talks, look at your books, get your books. Um, okay, here, here's a question. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking with you because you have such a wealth of, of knowledge and uh, experience within the space that you're teaching. And I'm curious with young people, because we have the, the young people who are very hopeful about a, a being a change for the future. And then we have the young people who have pretty much surrendered to, oh, this is the way it is. And they're so immersed in social media and they're eating the foods that really are impacting their emotional well-being, their state of mind and their hope for a better future. How do we how do we educate young people who they are immersed with, you know, eating fast food uh, at fast food restaurants. They're they're putting a lot of death into their body. And I'm a real believer that what you put in is what's going to come out. And I think that's why we have so much violence right now is the violence that's done to animals people are consuming. So how do we move the, the needle to change the narrative for the young people who in their heart of hearts, they would love to be a part of the solution, but they just don't know how to get started. Well, I would say it's actually um, even more problematic than that because many young people feel hopeless and right. about the future and anxiety and suicidality are on the rise and reaching epidemic proportions. So, and I don't personally think that that's because of what they're eating. I think that's because of um, a combination of things, the reality of what we're facing right. with um with climate change and 
and and other issues and also how that is portrayed in the media Mm -hmm. um it is easy to think that catastrophe is coming um and then to feel to give up and feel hopeless right right. so uh, honestly again the answer for me feels like we need to teach young people the solutionary framework that we've developed so that and we're seeing it you know we see that when young people go through the solutionary process in their schools they are engaged they are excited they say you know this is the best part of school they actively participate in creating positive changes and they can create positive changes like they they can start with their own school and what's served in their cafeteria you know that if they're going to address a problem we actually have a um short it's a 10 minute video on how to become a solutionary and it it you it it illustrates the solutionary process by kids changing what's served in their cafeteria so that's a great place for young people to start right. and they make some headway they benefit the environment benefits the school ben- everybody benefits so it's just a win 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 for everyone so those are the steps we need to take to empower young people joan baez the singer songwriter mm-hmm. once said mm-hmm. action is the antidote to despair mm. you're feeling despair as soon as you start to act as soon as you create a community and collaborate with people to create positive change, the despair dissipates. Uh, professor David Orr, he's a professor at Oberlin College, he had a very poetic way of saying this. He said, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. Ooh. And I love, love, love that that line because we need to use literacy, numeracy, the scientific method, method, research skills, we need to use all of that in service to something. And if you ask young people, I just watched a TEDx talk today um, by this amazing monk named Jenla, who created a school in India on the border of Bhutan and Nepal. It's called Jamtse Gatsal, the garden of, I think it might be forgetting the exact translation, the garden of love, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And what they ask in their school, they don't ask young people, what do you want to be? They Mm -hmm. ask young people, what do you want to contribute to the world? I love it. It's so powerful, that slight shift. What do you want to contribute? And suddenly your life is meaningful. All that you're learning in school has relevance. You build hope and evidence-based optimism from your own experiences. I, I love that. And uh, because you, you actually said exactly what I was thinking about bringing hope and, and we need so much hope. And, and uh, you know, this is, this is so uh, hopeful what you're sharing um, that I'm going to bring to my community. And you mentioned the uh, 10 minute video. What is the name of the 10 minute video? So I said just now how to become a solutionary, but I actually think it's become or becoming a solutionary. Okay. Is it on your website? Find it on our website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure to put the link in. I would assume that it's on YouTube also. It is. Yeah. Okay. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. And let's let's uh, take a, a step back and, and look at some other resources. Um, I think I read about you in uh, Eternal Treblinka, I believe it was. And yeah. because I uh, actually, it was a gentleman, Faik, who runs um, Vegan Stay. And it's a combination of bed and breakfast who are near sanctuaries. And if somebody stays at the bed and breakfast, a portion of the proceeds goes to the sanctuary, which is yeah. just phenomenal, phenomenal. And uh, he recommended that book. So I couldn't put it down. I was uh, obviously shocked as I was reading it, but uh, your name, you were in there and and um, I, I thought, okay, I need to find this amazing woman and have her on my podcast show. Um, that is definitely one book that I've recommended to people. What are some other books that you could recommend, uh, whether they be your own books or from other authors about raising the awareness and really getting involved so that we do have more hope? 
Well, since this is vegan visibility, and so there's a strong animal focus, I'm going to recommend books in that sphere. Um, but there's so, so, so many books that I could recommend. Um, I'll say my own first. So I wrote a book called Most Good, Least Harm. And it's the philosophy by which I try to live and encourage others to live. How can we do the most good and least harm to everyone, people, animals, and the environment? And so um, people can look for that book. And if you're interested in transforming the education system, I have a very short book, uh, The World Becomes What We Teach, Educating mm -hmm. a Generation of Solutionaries. I just had a tween novel come out this year called Claude and Medea. And it's a, a Moonbeam gold medal winner. And if you like tween novels, even if you're an adult or if you know a tween, uh, this is a book about young people who, because of a strange substitute teacher, they become clandestine activists in New York City and they have a big adventure. And it's it's an exciting story. I love it. So um, in terms of other books, I love Melanie Joy's Why yes. We Love Dogs. Um, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. I right. sometimes mix that up. That's a great one. Uh, there's the classic Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, which I think mm -hmm. everybody should read. Um, Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foyer is another great book. Um, a book that's really hopeful about the climate crisis is The Future We Choose. And the most recent book I've read that is an absolute must for everybody is George Monbiot's Regenesis. Okay. Okay. We'll make sure to put all that in the show notes for sure. And, you know, it, it for me, my activism switched uh, at about, I was probably three years into the vegan lifestyle and really immersing myself in the information. And I've had my business 30 years. And a couple of years ago, I made a conscious decision that I was going to focus on working with vegan businesses because a lot of vegan businesses don't know how to get that visibility. So that really is where I do some of my activism work. And, and it's so interesting because I think one of the greatest benefits that the pandemic had with all the shutdowns is that people had more access to information or maybe not more access, but they were confined to where they were looking for um, more information. And so it was kind of a domino effect. Um, it, as we wrap this up, uh, what are your final thoughts for people? And um, what can you one more time say that will give people hope that things are changing? Well, I would say that whether or not in every moment of every day, you feel hope doesn't matter. Do the work, mm. do the work and you'll feel more hope. What is the work? You have to find that out for yourself by asking those three questions. What issues do you care about? What do you love to do? What are you good at? You put those together, you're on a path for meaning and purpose right, right. there. And meaning right. and purpose will generate more hope. And when your hope fades, keep on going. Your hope will come back. Hope is a feeling, right? It, it comes at times, it goes at times. And one of the things that I always ask myself in the times when I feel despair and hopelessness, mm -hmm. which I do, I, I'm a positive person. I'm generally fairly optimistic, but not always. I know what we're up against. Mm -hmm. I know what can happen. Um, is I remind myself that I, I have to look in the mirror every day I mean, I don't have to, but it's right there when I'm brushing my teeth. There's the mirror. Do I want to have respect for the person who's staring back at me? Whether I have hope or not ultimately doesn't matter. My integrity matters. My doing the best I can with this one amazing life that I've been gifted. I am very lucky. I have food on the table. Mm -hmm. I have a home. Mm -hmm. I have a loving family. All that good fortune, I can't squander it just for me. I have to give back. And if we all, to the degree that we're able, to the degree that we do have food and a shelter and loving relationships, if we all are, ask ourselves, what can I do to give back a little bit? Right. We make that world. Collectively, we make that world. So I would invite everybody to go on that journey. 
I, I love that. And, you know, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours because you're you're so wise and you you have such a, a great perspective on um, how to get through the despair. Because, again, sometimes it, it does get to me. And then I talk to somebody like you and it's like, I know that I'm on my path and I just have to trust that because it just it pains me what I'm seeing in the world. And on your your site, you have some very interesting statistics, uh, not only about the people that are living day to day in poverty, but the um, communities that are the outlier communities. Um, I happen to be part of a few outlier communities. I, I've been sober for 40 years. I have a wife who I've been with for 34 years. And I, I see things going on and I think, you know, why is this happening? And rather than asking why, asking what can I do to be a part of the solution? So Zoe, it has been truly, truly a, a gift to have you on the show. And I would love to have you back and dig deeper into all the work that you're doing. And for everybody out there, please check out the website. And again, what is the uh, web address that people should go to, Zoe? HumaneEducation.org. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show. I'm your host, Kathleen Gage, wishing you a blessed day. You've been listening to the Vegan Visibility Podcast Show. Be sure to subscribe to get notified when the next episode is live. And we always appreciate reviews. Join us next time for more inspiration, education, and motivation to build your business one cruelty-free and healthy person at a time.